I'm delighted to welcome now on stage the panelists for the session on AI. And I introduce them by order of apparition on the podium. This is Francois Candelon, who is the senior director of the Boston Consulting Group uh, Think Tank Institute. Patricia Norman, who is VP AI for IBM. Kilian Gross, who needs no introduction, is the head of unit, the author of the AI Act. Kilian, great to have you. Please sit down. And we are being joined uh, online by Yeva Martin, Martin uh, Kernet, who is a VP AI at Telenor, <laughs> and she's also chairing the Ethno GSMA AI Working Group. Yeva, uh, welcome to Brussels. On the program, you know, we were privileged to have the Vice President of the Parliament, Eva Kaili. She, she's slightly delayed, so we hope that she will appear uh, a bit later in this session, but uh, so, so she, she should appear a bit, a bit, a bit later. Uh, uh, Patricia, I'm, I'm, I, I was hoping that perhaps for this session, uh, if Kilian agrees, we would first talk about AI and the economy and then gently move into telecom and, and then have a, uh, a debate with you, Kilian, on the, on the regulatory aspect. So st starting with you, uh, Patricia, from your vantage point at, at IBM, tell us a bit, this audience, how you see the impact of AI on the economy. Why will it change the life of our companies, the life of, of our society in the coming years? So thank you very much for the invitation and a wonderful afternoon to everyone here. So yes, I'm representing IBM and IBM with more than 100 years has a strong focus on artificial intelligence, um, not just from a technology perspective, but really with the conviction that that is something that will help us in when we are doing business, when we are doing um, things like um, sustainability, when we are also in the consumer area. So I believe that the big trends, and let me answer the question this way, the big trends we see in the future coming from technology is cloud computing, is quantum, and is artificial intelligence. So those are the three things that will change um, going forward, and that's where we as a company invest also when we do research and development. And within AI, the big, big, um, I always call it the top discipline within AI is everything around natural language understanding. So that is really the top, if that is something normal, if we do have a computer here that can join us on the panel and we don't even realize it's a computer, then we are really there. And that is where the heavy investment goes to. I believe in the consumer industry, we are not even aware where AI is around. And if we would pull out um, um, AI, I think we all would have troubles as consumers. However, I'm here representing very much the AI piece when it comes to business to business, when it comes to critical workload, to really critical infrastructure. And I think that is a different discussion here and also a different um, type of technology we need to apply. The IT industry, I'm very pleased to be here with the telco industry because we we know data needs hardware and compute power, but without the network, we would be nowhere. So thank you very much for thank having you. me. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Moving to you, Francois, from, from our past discussion, there is something that, that surprised me. Is You suggested, and I'm paraphrasing, so correct me if I'm paraphrasing you wrong, that perhaps European operators are a little shy to embrace AI, while from your, the many years you, sp you spent in Asia, you got the feeling that perhaps Asian operators were more keen to embrace AI and, and really go for it. So why? I mean, I, I don't know whether people in the room would agree, but why do you see this? So but I, I must admit that um, this is at least my experience. As you said, I spent uh, among, among around 10 years in, um, in Asia, mostly in China. And uh, I, I think that the, um, there are maybe um, two reasons. One is because it's very difficult to change in Europe, and I think that may be a regulation, and I'm not just talking about, uh, let's say, uh, AI or tech regulations, but labor laws and so on, makes it, make it very difficult uh, to change. Uh, the second thing is maybe um, a question about the appetite and the representation that telcos have of themselves. And, um, and, I had, um, and, and I think that's a pity, because on one hand, AI can be a real source of revenue enhancement, uh, let's say cost saving. 
on one hand, and on the other hand is an opportunity for uh, telcos to move from telcos maybe to techcos, uh, to use uh, fancy names. And um, in my experience with, uh, with um, Asian telcos, for instance, they were using data, and when you compare data, telcos, you have as much data or types of data than the Googles and the likes. Um, I had an example with uh, an Asian telco. We did the analysis in terms of demographics, in terms of browsing, in terms of transactions, and so on. They were as good as, as Google. The only thing was about geolocation, not because they didn't have the app, but because this app was less activated than Google Maps. So you have that. Some others, if you want to really embrace AI, you have a fantastic opportunity to, to get data scientists, because you are dealing with the most prominent topics, and you can be a real alternative to uh, AI native or tech uh, native companies. So with all of that, I think that's great. And on top of it, you are trusted. And I think that for telcos, you're, uh, the trust that people, your consumers, your customers have in you and in the way you, uh, you can address these issues is absolutely yeah. great and uh, is a basis. Because we all know that if we want to operate AI, we need what I would call a social license. Of course, there is responsible AI, but there are many other things, and the trust of the companies operating AI is one of the best advantages. Thank you, Francois. Social license, I see Killian jumping. We'll come to the social license later. Let's go to you, Yeva, and I'm, I'm sure you will want to jump on what Francois just said, but before you do that, I was wondering whether you could just say a few simple words for people such as myself who believe that AI and telco, it's all about network management, but it, it's more than that, I, I, I understand. So can you explain in simple word why AI is important for telcos from the point of view of a, you at Telenor and more generally for European operators? With the sun, Yeva, that would be better, but it's not, I hope it's not you. Jan, can you just put it the sound for Yeva? Can you do a sound check, Yeva? Say something. No, not working. What do I do, David? Do I? Yeah, try again. Try again, Yeva. Let's see. Guess, guys, if we had AI on this <laughs> panel, I can assure you this would not happen. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, me, let, let, well, let's fix that. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, but, but for sure, there are many other things. Personalization, for instance, which is the next way to mm -hmm. get churn and... Uh, yeah, but uh, perhaps returning <laughs> to you before, before a bit later, we go, we go to you, Kilian, when we enter what a lot of these people want to talk about, which is Annex 3 of AI Act. But not before the end. You know, this is if we discuss it too soon, you'll move to the coffee break. Uh, Patricia, you, you also, I mean, you work in Europe for IBM, but you discuss with your, with your colleagues in Asia, in, in, in the US. Do you share Francois' perception that in Europe we, we're a little shy to embrace AI and, and your, your counterparts in other regions are luckier than you are in pushing IBM AI products? Uh. Yes, yeah, so on the big scale, I would agree. Yeah? And I say that, that, that what we are losing by being shy is the opportunity to innovate. And we, we must not lose the opportunity to innovate. And innovation goes with taking also risk and being faster. And maybe on the point, right, why do we need AI in the telco industry? Look, what I see very much on an AI, or let me say, the AI use case is, for example, automation. And automation is big time when it comes to IT, is big time when it comes to network. Yeah? And that is really the use case we really live on a daily basis. Yeah? And it's about the prediction, but it's really about resource. How can we um, cut resources in terms of not needing that much in this, um, infrastructure in, in what we are doing with our application side? So I think a huge um, use case here when it comes to the network, and, and, and that's what is connecting us. We see um, uh, it very much like we should not refrain on, on trying things out and starting to do things. 
I really am convinced in the B2B context, we are underutilizing AI because we think there is something that could go wrong or the investment is not paying off. And I believe that to calculate the proper return on investments, we are sometimes far too much only in the area of infrastructure rather than really where is the business outcome. And in that sense, I think we could learn from the pure consumer industries um, how, how they use it. But again, in the industry we are in, and I liked what you said, Francoise, on the trusted piece. Yeah, I mean, a company like IBM, more than 100 years working with the most critical workloads around the globe, is it banking, financial industry, telco industries? A lot of you are clients of us and vice versa. That would be um, something, um, a missed opportunity if we don't build on this trust, um, trust reputation um, you have as an industry. And I think that is a great foundation, yeah, and coming back to the network, I think it's, it's automation is the use case um, beyond everything around customer care, customer intimacy, customer centricity, but the network, I think, on automation is something um, everyone should start with. Y Eva, can we make... Um another attempt and see whether without AI we're able to connect with you up there in the north? No. Hear me now. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always that was my ultimate dream to do it. No. Can we just tone down the echo, please? Yes. So if you hear me well. Perfect. Perfect. Let me say that for us AI, is the future of building a digital telco. There's no other choice but using analytics and data at scale, I would say. And we're doing it, as that was said already, to optimize our own network operations, to automate our customer care, to personalize our offerings. But I would like to touch upon this trust position because it's very important. I want to give you three examples where we use AI analyti analytics for for social good. The first example is together with our partners, we are building the green radio. We're basically greening our network operations and we are doing it by using advanced analytics. So that's one concrete example where we are reducing CO2 emissions, we are moving Europe to a next level and at the same time we are optimizing it for ourselves. The second example I think very much forgotten is that we're sharing mobility data and putting analytics on top for curing some of the big diseases. The COVID-19 is a good example, right? So we're able to predict the movement of people and in that way help companies and governments to manage the big, um, the big diseases such as epidemics such as COVID. And the third example that I want to put on is the automatic speech recognition. There has been said a lot about this natural language processing. What we can do and what we are doing for Europe, we're actually developing machine learning applications for small languages, for small European languages, because we have access to our customer service, we have access to spoken languages, and we're able to provide services for people with hearing disabilities, for people with dialects, for, for small languages that Europe is built on. So I think we should never forget that in addition to building our business for the future, we are also enabling the future of Europe. So this will be my three cents of why AI and how AI is basically a survival game for us. Eva, while, while we've got you and we hear you loud and clear, can, I, can you please react to uh, Francois' suggestion that perhaps uh, European telcos are, are not as brave as their Asian counterpart in embracing AI. Do you, is, it, is it something that you, an opinion that you share? Well, I could say that we are on a journey. We are certainly brave, and I think we are, we are seeing the value, but you should never forget that we should also deliver on our core business. We should deliver on our connectivity uh, service as we go. And at the same time, we need to basically build the new services on top. So I would say, yes, I agree. We need to be braver. We need to be bolder. But we also need to make sure that everything we invest into, the new networks, the new capabilities, we have a return on investment. So this is about being probably pragmatic 
bold and pragmatic and visionary. So I don't know if I agree with you guys, but I think we are onto something very, very bold in the future. François, I, I think that, and you need to be very bold. We talked a lot about network. I would like to have maybe one word about personalization and the way you change offers, because I think it drastically changes the way you operate. Uh, so personalization, you all know, it, it helps reduce churn and uh, increase upselling, cross-selling, and so on, by giving to an individual the right offer at the right moment which means that you don't need campaigns anymore, or you're on an always-on campaign. But this means that the, the work your marketers are doing is drastically, drastically changing. What they need to do is to experiment all the time, while all the rest will be either automatized or autonomized, in a sense, by AI. So, and I, I think this is where I, I've seen in Europe, compared to Asia, more, let's say, difficulties in making and operating this change, to have more, let's say, 360 uh, perception of their customers, something really to the point and so on. So I, I know and I appreciate the fact that you are on the move, um, and that's great, uh, but I think there is a question of speed to be at par with your counterparts. Uh, Maybe Patricia. I'll add on yeah. because yes. I remember it was a telco client, but already a few years ago, who told me, I don't need a website anymore. And I was looking at how come you need a website? Yeah, but back to your point, I mean, what do the clients want? They don't want to go on the website and search for something. They go because they want to talk to someone. Yeah? And talk doesn't need to be reading website. Talk needs to be, I don't know, a chat, needs to be a digital assistant conversation, whatever. But I remember myself, I was biased years ago, and I said, come on, without a website, no one of us survives. Yeah? But actually, what for do you really go there? Because you want a conversation with your provider, and you want the service as a client, and that can be handled completely different today than with a normal website, as we know. But we, uh, Patricia, we heard Yeva mention the question of the return on investment, the, the RIO. All right. You sit with clients regularly, I understand. Is it something that you, you, you experience, like you know, a willingness to move on to AI, but when you do the calculation, the bottom line is, is every, not? Every day. And, and we did a research and I asked ourselves, what is the main reason when AI projects are failing? And the reason we figured out was because we're actually targeting the wrong issue, the, the wrong problem. So prior to the AI project is really to understand what is it re really the problem we want to solve, and is that moving the needle on, the, on whatever we want to achieve, cost saving, more um, revenue on the side. So target the right thing is one thing. And the other thing on AI, which many clients are underestimating, is there is a lot of work to do in getting data digitized. I mean, maybe the telco industry, like the IT industry, has a lot of digital data already. But many of our clients yeah, come from a history with legacy, with analog data, and it takes roughly 80% yeah, investment to get things standardized, digitized, and then we can apply with analytics and with AI. So uh, this basic piece of work has to be done, and many clients underestimate, are frustrated, and said the business case is not working. Yeah? But so knowing I, this... I'll let Eva reply, but do you want to add to what Patricia no, says? What, what I would add to add is that AI is at the beginning, so we are not in a position to quantify everything. So I think that we need to have maybe to expand the way we think about benefits and the way we think about risks on both sides. And I give you one example. I, I did a, let's say a study with MIT where we identified cultural benefits of using AI because people think that the, um, the, 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 the decisions that are taken are better and therefore they enter into a virtuous circle because they, they dare more. This is something that is very difficult to quantify today. And so I think that AI, to a certain extent, is not a choice. You need to identify the big use cases, but then you need to go and to go big. One of the issues we face in telcos is that we don't do end-to-end um, -end enough, and AI doesn't like silos. So I think that you need to use AI to, to break your silos. Make me think of the known unknowns and the yeah. unknown unknowns. <laughs> that, uh, Can I yes, on it? please, Eva, your, your turn. Yeah, so let me say it very clearly. What we're super happy about in the telcos is that finally we start dehyping AI. I'm absolutely happy about it because what it brings, it brings very concrete business questions, very concrete technology questions. Where can we use 
AI and analytics to solve some of the most difficult problems, the problems that we've been sitting for many years, the problems that cannot be solved by manual work or a human, and the problems that would require are more investment, but also kind of new types of capabilities. So let me say very concretely that I agree, the basic layer has to be in place, but you should remember the telcos have been in operation for many years. We are and have been successful businesses. We actually delivered one of the best connectivity in the world. And we now have to cope with that and see what are the opportunities we can build on top. So I'm absolutely happy that finally we start dehyping AI. We start asking ourselves, so where is our data? What can we build on top of the data? What are the returns on investments? What use cases we need to prioritize? What people we need to hire? How can we scale across? This is finally getting into the board of directors or agendas in the telcos that I know. So the, the, the world, I mean, the, the life for us, I think, is brighter than it was even a year ago where everyone talks about AI. And I have to say, the most profitable investments into AI so far has been not on very fancy machine learning systems, but the opposite on very simple analytics where we can actually combine and compile our data sets for solving some of the most prominent problems for our customers or for our networks. So that's my re response to that. We need to continue building data capabilities. We need to continue be building leadership competence on AI. We need to finally start thinking of data as a strategic asset, as we have never done before. When I say data is a strategic asset, it's similar as a financial asset or a human. So that's what we are embarking on. And I'm super happy to see the telcos start investing very pragmatically in things that will give them returns on investment. Data is an infrastructure, says OECD, but uh, that's, uh, that's another And uh, if I may, I would even, and I agree, I would even go as uh, a step further. Yeah? I'm also glad that the hype is going out, yeah? but almost I see it as an obligation of our industries yeah? that we take out the hype because then we take out fear, then we take out your know, worry of people that, that this is something we need to be scared of. Yeah, so, yes. And also like your point on the silos, also that is one of the main reasons when things do not go wrong in AI projects, because companies work in silos. And yeah. you're a CFO and yeah. you don't give away your data, you're a procurement guy, you don't give away your data. So let's break the silos. Kilian, may, maybe to, be, before we speak later about hardcore regulation on removing fear that you know, may exist in some quarters on the social license to do AI, when you you know, a couple of years, a few years ago, when you started to work on AI, of course, from the commission point of view, you look at the great opportunity from an economic point of view to improve, to boost the competitiveness of Europe. But you were also conscious of the possible social backlash. How did you strike that balance? What representation did you have of EU citizens picturing that dreadful technology coming along? <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for that question, because I I really appreciate not only to come in as a regulator uh, and those, uh, the one who uh, destroys the party, but I think on the commission side, we always <laughs> had um, from the beginning um, a twofold objective and we always had a bit of a two pillar approach for, uh, since we started um, to have a more system syst systematic policy on AI. So on the one hand side, really to support AI because we think that AI is really um, a groundbreaking technology where we, Europe needs to catch up. So we have um, an objective of 20 billion private and public investment uh, in Europe in AI per year. We are now roughly at half of it, but that's our objective for this decade to achieve this. We have a coordinated plan on AI, which we adopted together with the AI uh, proposal, where we uh, suggested 70 actions together with member states how to boost AI in, for instance, skills is um, one of them, of course. We asked member states to, um, to draft national strategies on AI, which we coordinate together so to see where, what works well, to exchange, to, to focus, to, to strengthen where we are good at, to map as well and to understand where we have weaknesses. So we have, I think, a lot. We have in the Digital Europe program, we have uh, a new, a new schemes like the testing and experimentation facilities where we want to have give real life testing possibilities. We want to have a hub in each member state specialized on AI. So there's a lot of things. And we have proven, I think, a bit what my, um, the other speaker said, 
I think by reality, because if you look now at the COVID crisis, we would not be here sitting there uh, without masks, hopefully for longer, without AI, because uh, the uh, AI was crucial in developing vaccines or in developing uh, CT scans for lung diseases. So it's not only an economic issue, it's a societal issue. On the other hand, we know, of course, that in Europe, and that's, I think, what Ms. Vestager, our executive vice president, put out best. We like to do things the European way. So there is a bit of a certain fear of technology, and we cannot completely deny that, not a lot, but certain AI uses may be problematic. And that's why we want to do it the safe way, so we don't want to um, discriminate the whole technology. On the contrary, we want to boost it, but therefore we think we need some certain safeguards in order that everybody can rely on it. Because one thing what we see, and that's perhaps relevant for you, is that in Europe, not only the development of AI could be reinforced, we have very good developers, but we still like to bring it to the market, but as well the uptake, there's two sides. And we have far too few undertakings using AI, and we want to overcome that fear as well with this framework. Kilian, a quick question on the investment amount. I mean, I'm sure you'll tell me you're happy to accept more money, but when I compare you 10 billion today, 20 billion annual investment in AI by the end of this decade, and you compare this to, I have no idea, Drew, but what uh, some Chinese provinces, I mean, you see that in newspapers, absolutely staggering prices, places you've never heard of, and they, they spend that per year. Or you look at uh, CapEx by Big Tech. I know it's not just on AI, on AI, it's on cloud, it's on many things. It looks a small number to me, you know, 10 billion for us per year now, 20 end of the decade. Is that enough? Well, if you ask somebody from DigiConnect, is it enough? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, you will never get a, a fully satisfactory answer. I think it's a very good, it's a very important step, let's say. And we need to be as well uh, a bit realistic. I think what you point out is, is very, very valuable because we are in a competitive situation and we cannot ignore what other blocks in the world are doing, what the US are doing with more private-driven investment, what China is doing with more state-run investment. And we, we cannot allow ourselves here to lose the contact to the front runners and those who are really developing cutting-edge technologies. We need to, to catch up. I think we have a lot of, of strengths, we have a lot of uh, brilliant researchers, we have a, a lot of good, excellent companies, but we need really to bring more out there and to focus more on this. Um, so that is one step, of course, what we do. Uh, we, we have as well the recovery and resilience facility. You know, this is an important part now under the recovery. We think really it's important that member states use this in order to boost technology and not just to cover uh, old industries, so to say, but really to bring industries forward. I mean, all in all, it's always, of course, these figures, they indicate something and it's important to, to measure. But on the other hand, we always see it's as well a bit difficult to be completely precise on how much you invest in AI because AI is in <laughs> is, reality is in, yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And in a lot of companies, you invest in AI without knowing that this is AI because it's part of your technology yeah, yeah, development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I so wouldn't take the figures in absolute. I think yeah. it's an indicator yeah. that we have to reinforce our efforts. And we as a union, we need to contribute yeah. to this uh, reinforced effort. So we may invest more without knowing it. Let's, uh, let's hope that, uh, <laughs> that this is true. Francois. Maybe I think you said two words that were very important. The first one is about fear. And I think that the less we know, the more scared we are. And therefore, education, and I would like to say that what, for instance, Finland is doing with their MOOCs in trying to have people understand what AI is and is not, uh, is very critical. And the second thing is when you said the European way, because I think that it's very cultural. And what you see, for instance, in China or in the US, and even the way it's approached, uh, and I'm not a specialist, but more in, in Europe, more about product safety in the US, more about, let's say, uh, customer uh, understanding. And in China, where it is more seen as a societal question and issues, is very important. And we need to understand that regulations won't be global. So uh, I think that these two elements were very important. We, we, we'll, we'll come back to this, this important point, whether in our, well, is our, world, is our world increasingly globalized? I can no longer say that. So, so we'll, we'll, but before we, we go back to this question, Francois, uh, Patricia, what, what would you do to, to, uh, before we leave this question of social acceptance of AI? What would be your top list of things to do to boost social acceptance of AI in, uh, in Europe? What would, you, would be the simple steps that you would take to, to remove the fear that you describe? Yeah, so I, th I think one is, um, and actually it's on the obligation of companies like, like I'm presenting here, that we provide tools and we provide um, 
uh, let's say also um, thoughts, how we can make AI transparent, how we can make it explainable, how we can make it open. We've heard already, um, I think from Roberto, he said it, it must be closed technology, it must be open technology, so that we can build on whatever we have to build on. And I think that is something um, that can take out fear, yeah? that we don't say it's something secret that happens somewhere, it has to be transparent how it works. Yeah? And one thing how to get there is to apply AI only for a certain purpose. So not for generally we're doing something. So what do we want to solve here? And to give you an example, for example, um, face recognition software. Um, IBM was one of the first companies that pulled the software from the market and said, why? Because we can give this software to anyone and then it's being applied for use cases that are most of the case negative. So let's use and apply AI for a certain purpose that has a sense and brings us as an industry or us as a society forward. And that said, again, we believe very much in trustworthy AI, in transparency what we are doing, in trying to explain things, in providing technology that helps you to figure out where there is bias. I mean, we're all human beings and we're all biased, so no one can declare um, someone is not. But we can help uh, with technology also to take out um, bias here and to try to be as fair as possible when it comes to AI. Mm. And transparency, I know transparency then means, okay, I'm giving away something and my competitor learns from me because I'm transparent what I'm doing. Mm. But in terms of taking out fear and being faster to, to try out something, for me, that's a fundamental um, basis. Be before we move uh, with, with you as well, Yeva, on the AI, the assessment of uh, uh, Kirian's proposal, uh, the AI Act. Ca can I just uh, ask uh, you, Yeva, Patricia, and, and, and Kilian to to uh, respond to Francois's provocative suggestion that perhaps there will not be such a thing as a global regulation for AI because of uh, different uh, social acceptance, different situation, different uh, challenges, shortages. Who wants to? Who volunteers? Maybe you, Kilian. You're a professional regulator. You should you should start. So, should we first of all do we need some sort of a, not harmonize? Of course, every region will have its own cooking. But would it be desirable that you know around the world we move towards some sort of a you know common broadly common scheme, or is it not really needed? Basically, everybody can do his cooking. Yeah? No, I think it's certainly the first because we, we know technology doesn't really know frontiers. A lot of things are developed in other parts of the world. We will want to use these technologies uh, and we don't want to increase trustworthiness in order to protect our markets. It's not our, our interest. Our interest is to have trust. We want to have a level playing field. We want to make sure that those systems which are then used in Europe uh, are played, are complying with our rules, but we would like to invite as many as possible. But I. I see, of course, we are here uh, more advanced than perhaps other parts in the world, but there is a lot of interest in other parts in the world as well in this topic. I think I wouldn't underestimate this, even if perhaps here again we have a European approach maybe a little bit different. In the US, you have the Bill of Digital Rights, so there's as well a discussion going on. There are some in some states, there are not horizontal, but uh, um, certain sectoral legislations. We see UNESCO is working on it with a recommendation. The Council of Europe is very intensively working on it. The OECD, GPI. Um, so there is a number in international fora. This is, um, I think, the, the ethical issues or the underlying principles are gaining momentum. And even if still there is, of course, divergences, do we need a binding framework? Should it first be soft law or codes? Or should it be recommendations? But what I would see is more and more that there is more or less a, a, among what we call like-minded countries a certain common understanding that certain principles would need to be respected. Then, of course, you can still discuss how to spell this out, but I would not see an overwhelming divergence in these principles, so that data must be correct, objective, right. transparent, that you mm -hmm. have to have a certain documentation, that you have to ensure certain human oversight, and these kind of things, are, I think, are getting common ground. Yeva, on, on this notion that we need a broader collection of countries, broader than the European Union, adopting uh, like-minded principles to regulate AI, is this important or unnecessary? Well, let me put this way. Um, let's stop fantasizing about AI. That's what I would call all of us, not only in Europe, but else in the world. AI is not a 
uniform term that we should start regulating on. There's a lot of valuable AI which carries zero risk, but carries enormous impact to the society. Let me give you just a concrete example we in Telenor and the telco world are using. We are calculating simple averages of data usages on our base stations, and based on the statistical averages, we are reducing CO2 emissions to the, to the society. So this is just such a small, such a little small example showing that there's so much analytics and data used for low risk. So that I would always start of de-hyping, de-fantasizing AI. At the same time, there are high-risk AI applications, probably a minuscule part that will be used in Europe, and that will need to be regulated. And on top of it, there are, of course, cases on technology improvements that will not be ever possible to regulate because technology will always go advanced and they'll always go one step ahead of the regulation. So we need some ethical guidelines to be able to talk the same language. So I would agree with Kilian and everyone else saying that we are building that ethical framework. But as I said, I will repeat again, we should start a discussion in Europe de-hyping, de-fantasizing AI, showing use cases of simple applications that create benefit to the society. It's words of wisdom. It's true that Brussels has a tendency to focus on what goes wrong and what should be regulated. And indeed, most AI will not require any regulation because there is no impact uh, on fundamental. On, Patricia, on, on, on this question of uh, uh, the need for an international, not a uniformity, but commonalities of use across region. Is that something that is dear to your, to your heart as, a, as IBM? Would you like to be selling more or less the same solution around the world? Or, or could you cope with widely different? Hello, uh, forgive me, Patricia. Keep that question in mind. We have Eva Kelly, Vice President of the Parliament Online. Then after that, we talk about high-risk AI system and telecom. Eva, good afternoon. Ah, Delighted right. to have you. Floor is yours. Hi, I'm sorry for intervening like that, but uh, we had the plenary today and uh, things develop in an unexpected uh, manner. We have uh, President Trudeau addressing the plenary um, in a bit. Um, so, first of all, I want uh, to thank uh, you for the very interesting event that you have invited me and Mr. Uh, Professor Costantinos Masalos for uh, um, asking me to participate. Um, I heard what you said, actually, so I had the time to listen that too much regulation is not what you expect or uh, being always um, uh, overprotective um, could uh, perhaps stifle innovation. I think that in, in regards of um, regulation, the AI Act is a uh, very interesting file. It's the first legal framework that uh, globally is being actually introduced. And um, I think it's uh, important that it raises this debate of uh, uh, deciding what kind of AI we, we want. Because AI, in, um, you can define it in several different ways, but in the end, instead of just being complementary, uh, technology that can offer solutions, uh, solve problems, or like present uh, um, uh, easy and faster access and um, uh, make a more fair and transparent, perhaps, decision. In the end, it could also take decisions and implement them if it's embedded in hardware. And it's very difficult to understand through the deep learning process why and how this occurred. So we, we, we need to control and understand this technology and to see um, how we want to use it. So I think um, we can speak and I can start like saying some, some positive things. We had uh, DeepMind uh, predicting the 3D structure of uh, um, hundreds of thousands of proteins, I think three, 350, um, including uh, everyone made by humans. And at the same time, DeepMind uh, uh, trained an AI system to control the plasma required for unlocking the potential of nuclear fusion. Um, so, so this is like just, a, I think, an important example of how AI can enhance our capacity for discovery and innovation. Um, it, uh, it, of course, uh, is an application designed in a human-centric way, 
it can uh, also by design help us overcome biases and also create more opportunities and fair opportunities for all. Uh, but with the pandemic being an accelerator, we realize that we are more interconnected and uh, uh, between us and also the physical with the digital world. And we have more challenges in the digital world actually that we need to prepare for. Um, I think also now the algorithms uh, are being more understood by the um, by more people. I know, uh, speaking on behalf of my colleagues, but now we have more people knowledgeable of how we can act by design and uh, what we should be aware of. Um, uh, we understand, of course, the potential again of like the, the value that the estimation changes and usually changes up. Uh, it's been valued at the 15 trillion by 2030, just 2 trillion in Europe alone. Um, and we, we try to understand how by providing legal certainty, we can unleash this uh, potential. I think creating trust and legal certainty is, is uh, actually a key to do that. So the AI Act has uh, a few things that we are still um, uh, have to discuss, how we proceed with biometrics, face recognition mainly, um, and of course to decide this index of risk, how it's gonna change what are the metrics that would um, identify an application as unacceptable and or an application of a high risk? Uh, and uh, what are the obligations that the high risk application should, um, should follow? Um, I think also it's uh, very important to, uh, to understand that in Europe, harmful AI is uh, mainly identified in, in the health, in the transportation, um, and of course, uh, anything that could undermine our fundamental uh, rights and values. Um, so uh, I, I think it, uh, we need to find a methodology to be able to measure that, because again, I believe we need to be uh, creating legal certainty and not uncertainty. But the good thing is that low risk AI is actually the majority of the uh, applications that we, um, uh, that we need to, um, to regulate. So um, finally, um, talking about an ethical framework, I think it's very important since Europe with the GDPR showed that we want to have the principles there and we also need to influence like-minded and, and non-like-minded countries because these are technologies that go beyond our physical borders. Um, but um, just by, by setting like global benchmarks, let's say, uh, in these achievements, uh, but still, I'm uh, very happy and interested to listen to you because you have excellent speakers today with you and uh, extremely knowledgeable. And our obligation is to protect citizens, but also listen and understand the potential of the technology and make sure we will not create uh, more barriers for this technology that could save lives and provide us with solutions. It's not a vaccine, but it could lead us to find the vaccine that would uh, actually um, let us go back to normal. Vice President Kelly, and you answered a number of questions that were raised during the panel. So, so wonderful. You did very well in catching up. Oh, is she gone? Okay, I wanted to, no. So, no, one question I, I would like to ask you uh, is what is the mood in the parliament? When you speak to your colleagues, are they like you, more in the vein of more stay application? Uh, uh, will have no negative impact on human beings, therefore let's embrace the technology? Or are they more in the te technophobic move or what's this new unknown things that regulate it? What is the mood when you speak to colleagues at the coffee machine at the parliament? It sounded like, by the smile, it sounded like a good question. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do we... Okay. To new technologies? But after the um, pandemic, I believe that everybody uh, is expecting to find solutions in the technology and the perceptions change and we consider it, uh, uh, we have a positive approach. So I think um, this would be the way that our prism has changed for technologies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President Kelly. I'm looking at my watch. I think it's time we talk about regulation, Kilian. I was hoping, you know, to chit chat all your way out of, of here so that you get out of here easily. And, you know, before asking uh, 
people for the first. I think I'll ask the question myself, all right? Because you all want, you have all the same question, I think. Yeah? You know which one I mean, Ines. So, as you know, the Slovenian presidency, apparently the French presidency is supporting <coughs> the ID, has suddenly moved digital infrastructures, which include our beloved telecom networks, into the category high-risk AI systems, Kilian. It was, I know it was not your idea. It was not in the commission proposal. And, and you know, I'm sure that Yeva will explain you that, you know, there is nothing to worry about. It's really unjustified. But perhaps, perhaps first, let's, let's give you the floor, Kilian, and, and see whether you can talk the consular of this strange idea. Well, um, usually we do not really comment what the council presidency has done. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to, to be uh, the cliffhanger <laughs> and to invite you to come back next year, then I can tell you what will be the outcome. The truth is, the truth is of course, that I, I simply don't know because this is ongoing negotiations. But what I can tell you is what we had in the Commission in mind is really a narrow system. As Eva Kaldi has put it, we want really to, what we see, think should be regulated is about 10% perhaps of AI systems. And it should as well be the clear message from this regulation that the 90 other percent are safe and don't need any intervention. That's, I think, as important as regulating the 10 percent, which may be critical. We have, in order to be clear, we wanted that the legislator undergoes the test what should be high risk or not, because we don't think it's really helpful for operators if we give abstract criteria to assess risk and then leave everybody alone with this risk assessment, because we think that is extremely difficult and given the liability or the consequences, legal consequences would be very unfair. So that's why we came to Annex 3, the famous Annex 3. And here we have areas, so if you're out of an area, you're out completely, it cannot be uh, amended, and we have then in the areas use cases, and the use cases are really those which are then decisive and should be as precise as possible. And in order to keep up to pace with the technological development, we foresee delegated acts so that over time we can amend, because we think it should really be facts-based. So our approach was we should only put things on the list where we are convinced that we have enough evidence that today there is a problem and not perhaps one point in time, there may be a problem. And that should then allow this adaptation. So what we put in the annex as a commission is um, um, one area is critical infrastructure, and we added one use case on energy, uh, on water, and on um, road management. Uh, now the Slovenian presidency has added an, uh, another use case, which is, of course, a very a fair point, and we will see now how they continue to discuss this. It's as well important to note what they added is AI used to control or as a safety component of these digital infrastructure. So it's not every AI in a digital infrastructure, but it is as well quite important for us that we are precise in what we design because AI, let's say AI in a car is not per se dangerous because you can use AI in order to, 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 to choose your music or the best temperature or whatever you like. It's only if it has a, a safety function in that car and is decisive how the car drives. And that should of course hold true as well for the other AI system. So whatever will be in the end there, we will try to make sure as a commission that the, say, the use cases are sufficiently precise. So because that the overall objective to distinguish what is really risky and what is not risky is achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Kilian. Perhaps going to you, Yeva, and, and see what you react to Kilian's response. Are you worried about this possible inclusion of digital infrastructures in Annex 3? In, uh, Absolutely, we're reading every single word and comma now in the Slovenian presidency text. I have to say that we are concerned. And we are concerned with the fact that the current inclusion, what the Slovenian presidency have made, expands the scope of high-risk areas. And suddenly, the electronic communications networks, the telco networks, are part of the digital infrastructure. More than that, it adds not only the digital infrastructure, but also the wording becomes quite, quite uh, well, con concerning for us. When you say control or as a safety component, well, our concerns basically gets to every type of analytics we use to make our networks better served, to, be to use optimization to get our networks kind of served at the lower cost, we all know that our investments into 5G and 6G technologies will not be lower, they're actually going to be bigger. So if we suddenly become part of the category where any control, if you like, or management of, of telco networks becomes a high-risk area and we suddenly are part of this 
are, you know, carbon sum process um, on the high risk AI area, we are suddenly very much concerned. So what we are doing now in the GSMA and Ethno uh, AI task force, we have already prepared our position. We're absolutely clear that we need to look at this as a proportionate approach preferably actually take out digital infrastructure from that equation, and if not, then be extremely clear on what do we mean by saying control and or a safety component. I have to remind you that the AI we use on our electronic communications networks are made for good. An example I used in Green Radio, the only risk in this example is that we are actually using more energy. Because in this example, we never cut the connect the um, the coverage layer. So we have to be extremely clear, extremely precise, as Killian says, on what do we mean in order not to actually expand this area for, for bad of our society. So this will be my, my, my approach. And we have a position, we have a very good connection to both the European Parliament, the Commission and the presidencies, where we want to really explain, give concrete examples in which way we only improve, actually, the well-being of our citizens. As Iskelian said, we have to make extremely, we have to be extremely clear if high-risk AI gives, you know, uh, impacts fundamental rights, safety, and security of the citizens, and in which way this does, it has to go under the regulation. But so much of AI, 90%, as Killian says, doesn't do that. So we, if we suddenly put the digital infrastructure as a whole in this and control of it, then we are absolutely concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Yeva. Can I get a feel for whether there is a question from the room? No, don't see, don't see any. You, you're really shy eh, today. So, no, the, 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 a quick comment on that on my side. I would have thought that if AI posed some sort of security issues, it would be covered by the security provision in the code and soon in the NIST 2 directive. That's where more I would look into, into that. Uh, something I'd like to, looking, looking at the AI act more positively, uh, uh, I, I would perhaps uh, uh, ask you, Patricia, uh, and you, Francois, if you have any thought, I mean, it's a difficult question, but I remember the GDPR. You remember GDPR 2015 was adopted and then for years companies were scratching their head. What is it that they should have been doing? And then, you know, what could companies do to be, to pave the way, to be proactive, to be AI, AI Act compliant, you know? And I'm talking, of course, only those companies, 10 person, whatever, that do, that do uh, AI application that are high risk. Or, or, or so on the one hand side, I appreciate the work that's being done and also this distinction that we don't want to regulate or put um, principles on, on the technology in itself, but we really put the risk and the associated risk in, in focus and regulate um, these things. So that's very much what, what we also appreciate. The, the, the thing, what I want to add is also to distinguish AI is not there and it decides and makes mistakes there. It's us humans that are heavily interacting and deciding when we do make um, or when we do allow AI to take a decision, for example. And let's not forget that we're not in a black box where something happens and no one can explain anymore. And if we are, then it's because we allow it to be there. So I would like to bring us as a humans here very much um, to decide when we believe it's the right thing to apply AI. And back to your question, yeah, I think we can learn from GDPR. I mean, we all went through that we discussed <laughs> a lot, and at the end, the world was also a bit looking to us and saying, okay, that's not so bad what we did. But what we learn is, I think, not to wait until everything is finalized and negotiated at, at, at the end, because let's start today and do things and be prepared uh, and then learn as we go. I think that would be my learning um, coming from um, GDPR. Also, Maybe what I would like to add, because Kelly and I truly agree with what you said in trying to have things that are based on evidence because it's very difficult to think about all the issues that we might face and I fear that telcos you have a lot to get from AI but that you might then be too much focused on how to limit risks instead of innovating because I, I think that um, you mentioned Eva about the, um, the hype and 
I know that Telenor is really meeting the hype because you're very innovative and that's important, but telcos, uh, I'm old enough to remember that in, uh, uh, when I was working with France Telecom at that time in 2001, uh, someone from the executive committee telling me, oh, instant messaging is useless because it doesn't bring one, uh, one euro. <laughs> or that uh, at that time, voila, the uh, search engine uh, from France Telecom was better than Google, at least in French. And then, so it's good to limit the hype and make it concrete, you know, but not to limit imagination on what you can do with it. Eva, a quick word on whether telcos should already get ready now to comply with the AI Act, or should they do nothing because, frankly, they don't do appli AI applications that, that are high risk? <laughs> oh. No, I think, first of all, I have to be crystal clear, we are supporting the regulation, I mean, on especially evidence-based high-risk AI. This is needed. We see that's the way of doing a business in Europe, and it actually carries value. What we want to bring along, we want to bring the telco perspective, the use cases, the arguments, and the evidence showing that what we are bringing at the table or AI for social good, AI for improving our ability to have high quality connectivity, our ability to innovate. And we're actually doing our hard work internally. That's not easy. It's not walk in the park. It's absolutely difficult. So my take on that, number one, regulation is needed. It creates legal certainty, brings Europe to a new level and a next level, but it has to be evidence-based. It has to provide and kind of give impetus to innovation boost in Europe. And in order to do that, we have to make it proportionate. We have to listen to the experts, to the biggest and smaller industries in Europe. Listening to them is important because they give you their pain points, but they also give you an, a better view of what it takes and what they deliver. And our telco perspective on that, I will repeat myself, I think we need to revisit this digital infrastructure piece in the annex on high-risk AI, and we need to bring use cases and explanations on why and what exactly goes under high risk of digital infrastructure. If this is only 10% of use cases that are considered to be high risk by the commission, we need to stick to that. And, and that will be my call for, for listening, for continuous discussion and debate on it, and absolutely agree with the speakers, being brave, being bold, and being pragmatic. Thank you. Thank you, Yeva. That you. will be. <laughs> Kilian, a, a few concluding words, because I'm, I'm looking at my watch. It's almost four. Uh, and and on, this, on this point by Yeva, that uh, industry should do its part in explaining more what they do, and, and, and regulators should listen, where is that dialogue, dialogue taking place, you think? Well, you well, here th this afternoon, it proves that it does take place, but <laughs> I think beyond that's the, that. The purpose of all of us getting together here today, I think, uh, indeed, I mean, a number of speakers mentioned we should demystify AI. Uh, we should, that's why we need to talk about it. We need to be transparent. Uh, a lack of transparency can discreditate technologies. We have seen that. We have seen the past technologies which suffered from that uh, for years, like nuclear, uh, because uh, um, so we need to have a clear clear communication. I think industry should engage. We, are, we want to prepare well for the entry into force of the um, AI regulation once adopted. So we will we start to develop the standards because we will base very much on, on standards. So I can only invite you then as well to engage with standardization organizations to support that work because then we want to have good and pragmatic standards and to hear as well society. We will have certainly at the end as well an, an expert group where industry will be heard. So to, to engage and to participate in that process I think can only be of benefit and can never be uh, underestimated. So I think I wouldn't wait until things drop from heaven, but to be start to be a maker and to continue yeah. to how it will be shaped in the end. Thank you, thank you, Kilan. Final word for me is I'd like to quote you, Eva. AI should be dehyped, and Telco can do a lot of things which are not even low risk AI <laughs> systems. So go for it. On this, please join me in thanking our great panelists. I think it was a fascinating panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we go?
and we'll be back in half an hour for a great session on the DMA.